So good morning and welcome to our first panel for History Lives Here Month. This is something that Kathy and I have been dreaming of doing for a long time. And we're very excited to have the uh, Orchestra mm -hmm. Genealogy Club host this first panel meeting. Uh, these fine folks have been most gracious to participate today. And I wanna thank them. And it's Abby Arndt Reeb. Carolyn Clark Leone, also known as Jerry, <laughs> um, Susan Clark, Clark Fleischer, maybe John Fleischer, I don't know. Nope, I don't think so. <laughs> Dave Page and Tom Tillman. I just really want to thank you guys for being here. <laughs> About the time we were we were we were recruiting this panel, um, the Orcas Island then and now page was created on Facebook and wow, we have had some great reach with members joining and pictures being posted and lots of conversation. So if you haven't been on that side, I urge you to be. Uh, we, we do intend to do more panels in the future um, and hopefully in person at which time we can focus on other topics at time periods. And it also gives more people a chance to be involved in this panel. And I was looking for the, uh, some, some diverse people on this and I think that we accomplished that. <laughs> so um, this is one of those experiences that would be ideal if it was live, but um, Hopefully we can do that in the fall. So please understand, we're kind of learning this as we go along. So um, today our panel will be doing most of the talking, but if you have questions or comments, you can post them in the chat and we'll be monitoring those and maybe asking as we go along or when that's appropriate. So Holly has put together a short um, video for us from our practice session with this group last week and if I'd like to have you go ahead and show that now, Holly, if you can. Okay. Well, I, I was living at Olympic Lodge. That's a big part that I'm missing here. That's when I moved to Deer Harbor, I ran out of money. I couldn't afford that trailer anymore. And I asked Denise, where else is there a place to live around here? And they said, well, you know, they rent. There's, there's rooms for rent down there at the lodge, but it's kind of a different kind of place, you know? <laughs> is it still there? Uh, Olympic Lodge is still there at the end of, uh, just below the dance hall. Oh, okay. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's it was seven acres, uh, yeah. a two-story, 4,000 square foot uh, home with a uh, craftsman style built by Henry Caillou, one of the island fathers. Um, he platted Deer Harbor. Uh, he was a Native American who uh, was very successful gill net fisherman, and uh, and he uh, married a white woman who had uh, children from a previous marriage. So he needed a place, respectable place to house them. So he built Olympic Lodge. Well, he didn't call it that, but uh, Margaret Triforos, who was Greek, she named it Olympic Lodge. Um, but uh, so Henry Caillou built that house, and it was a grand, grand home. 
And, um, and it gave me a, an appreciation for the craftsman style, which I had had already, but I, I'd never lived in a craftsman style home. It had two uh, Rumford fireplaces and uh, I ended up, uh, I lived in two different rooms before I graduated to the master's suite, which overlooked Deer Harbor. And uh, those were seven fantastic years of my life. And uh, uh, we had our very own bar down there called the Buck and Doe Cafe. And we could mosey on down there and drink Budweiser till our eyeballs fell out. And, uh, and then uh, David and Jill Hesselmeely hosted a uh, Friday night, all you can eat, $5 seafood buffet. <laughs> and there were pool tables and a wood stove and satellite TV, which at the time was a big deal. And um, so that was pretty grand. Okay, hey, I thought this would be kind of an interesting question. What is gone now that, that you remember that was something that you really miss? Whether it's a building or a business or whatever. The drive-in? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Who ran the drive-in? Um, the Stearns, you guys all went to it, didn't you? And the, um, um, oh, I, I, I can't think, their daughter's name was Edith, and I can't remember the son's name who was killed in Nam. Martha, and Martha Edith, and Lloyd. Yeah, Lloyd was killed in Nam. Yep. And Margaret and Edith, and what were the parents' names? Do you remember? Inez and oh, that's good for you, Inez and yeah. So do you know where it was? It was it was uh, across from the Legion, across the Legion, the right across. So it's now a I don't know storage unit. So they had two. They had a big screen that was in between uh, two big fir trees, and with with speakers on them. And, uh, and then they had a house where they housed the, the project, projector and also you could get your popcorn and whatever else. And it was 50 cents and you could come in and you either roll down your windows and listen to it or we often took a pickup truck and turned it around back and, and had nice seats in the pickup truck. Um, and then there was a place you could sit in front of the house. Um, but that was great entertainment in the summertime, wasn't it? You know. Yeah, I bet it was. What, how long did they run that for? They ran it and I don't know when they started, but they ran it until there, there was a big storm and the uh, and the roof blew off the, the um, projection room and ruined all the in stuff. And so they didn't, they didn't have enough money to start it again. Wow. Well, there was the Columbus Day storm. Columbus Day storm. Yeah. 63 would have been when all that. Yeah. Happened. And then our uncle built Seaview, but I don't know what year. Yeah. That was after, yeah, we didn't have, then, then your uncle built Seaview, you know. No. But she, yeah, she went to school in the Doe Bay schoolhouse, so she's the one that pointed out where it was when I went to try to find it and found all the desks buried. What? Yeah, I found all the Doe Bay desks buried. It's uh, it's on a trainer property, uh, Steve and Trish Trainer's property. So we, we went out there with metal detectors and dug around, and we, apparently they just plowed over the school. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Did you did you rescue any of those desks, or were they gone? Yeah, I mean they were all broken in pieces. I gave some of the better pieces to the museum, and then I've got one or two pieces here. So, but we found other stuff like marbles and pins and things like that. Fun. I miss the school, frankly. I mean, uh, the building is still there, but there's all the other crap behind it now. 
um, when I went there, first and second grade, Mrs. Langell, third and fourth grade, uh, Mrs. Meredith, fifth and sixth, Mrs. Van Worm, seventh and eighth, all those were on the first floor. You had a cafeteria there, and then high school, you know, floaters upstairs. And there were 10 people in my graduating class. And uh, I, some of them are still here or have come back. And uh, there were different social groups. Um, I was not among the social people, <laughs> I might add. But uh, once again, you knew everybody. And we all took the school bus. Hardly anyone drove. I mean, yeah, it was even, all school bus. Yeah, and I got was made to sit on the front steps of the school bus many times for fighting. Oh, no. Um, we were on the Deer Harbor. It went from Deer Harbor to East Sound and up, oh, up what we called the back road. Oh, that was it now has the most Kimple stupid Hill. name. Yeah, Enchanted Tree or something. Enchanted Forest. I hate that name. <laughs> stupid. Everything's and, a lane now. And then there's there was the Orcus bus and then the Alga bus. Mm -hmm. And to me, Alga was completely unknown. The people stayed there. Yeah. And we they showed up in school, and of course you know him, but but you never saw or did anything with all because it was so far away. So there you have my memory. That's so I was in the school before the brick building was built. I it, it was a two story um, shiplap white building. And I was in first grade there. And then for some reason, I was thinking about that today. I was chosen to give flowers to Nellie S. Milton on the opening of the of this new school, the brick school. That yeah, was first grade when I went to the new school. That was where I started. So yeah, kindergarten. It's just first grade you started. I I started. There was no kindergarten. No. Uh -uh. And and the the rest the the food at this school was really good. It was uh, run by um, Irene Senf, and she would spend all summer canning fruit and vegetables. And she would, she, I mean, it was really good. I, I must have, uh, she really liked me. So I don't know whether she gave me extra food or, but she was always really nice to me. I remember. <laughs> well, course, now we wouldn't, allow anybody to bring hand canned goods that they'd done no mm -mm. no roadkill she did roadkill <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we all dared each other to eat dirt and worms and that's oh my god well you, hey you're still here so <laughs> we're all still here right <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> well, that was fun. All right. So I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves and tell a little brief um, history of how you got here or why you're here and how long you've lived on the island. And um, just a little brief. And I'm going to start with you again, Abby. <laughs> okay. So um, we, uh, my parents bought our place from Lou Dodd in 1946. Um, uh, there was 80 acres here. We only have 40 now. Um, and we've sold some, but, um, uh, and I went to school. I started, we lived in Los Angeles and daddy would do movies and then we would come up. And um, we, uh, my mother used to say the fishing season got later and the hunting season or whatever got earlier and pretty soon we might as well just live here. Um, Daddy started cattle farming and uh, we went to school. I have two brothers, Derek and Rocky, and we, we rode the school bus. I didn't say this the last time, but I have fond memories of riding that school bus, especially when we got to Bodie's Corner because Eleanor Bodie and then Bobby Schaefer, the next stop, had beautiful voices. And I, I, they used to sing all the way and harmonize all the way to school. 
And I remember being a little girl with sitting on that bench seat with my feet state sticking straight out and um, asking, please sing today. Will you please sing? They probably hated me. But, and then um, as I grew up, I had a variety of jobs on the island. I've, I've worked at um, uh, the uh, cottage gift shop at the Orcas Hotel at the library at um, uh, the Orca Sander at the lumber yard. And then the last 18 years I worked, uh, I was at Four Winds Camp. Um, and uh, the, that was the hardest job because I was not in, this, in, in the community anymore. I drove to Deer Harbor and drove home. And, uh, um, but I loved working at the Sander the best, I think. Oh, and also Siren recently. So, um, I, uh, uh, I, was, I was gone for pretty much during the 60s with uh, school, college, working, and came back in the in 70, 71, something like that, and um, married, divorced, married my wonderful husband, Raleigh, and have two children, and that's it, over and out. <laughs> <laughs> and on lots of been on lots of boards i might yeah, add i bet you have and your maiden yeah. name aren't so um you'll see the sign in the middle of the island with the cattle and that that now belongs to my brother rocky but it driftwood ranch and daddy wrote grew um raised charlet cattle they were french and he was most enamored of the white cows that he saw when he was a young lad touring um, France. And so we, we raised and, and showed they, daddy and Derek and mother used to show these cattle all over the country. Uh, I wasn't terribly involved in cows. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to have you go next. Um, Tom Tillman. Um, our connection to the island started in 39 when my mom's father moved here. He was a logger and worked hotel stuff. Uh, then you kind of got a fast forward to when I was uh, born. My parents, uh, my dad was a college professor and mom was a psychologist. And um, she was living in the Philippines with my dad. They got pregnant in their mid forties and decided to uh, just settle down in the US and dad wanted to open a youth camp. So we ended up, uh, mom knew about Orcas. So we, they ended up on Orcas and bought property here for the youth camp. And they never did do the youth camp although they did a Ranger Rick program here on the island that a lot of kids were part of. Uh, and then in 82, we were here, we were here every summer until 82 and then 82, we moved here full time. And then since then I I've been here except for when I left for college and I, I like Abby, I've had a lot of jobs on Orcas, including working with Abby at the Sounder <laughs> and I worked at the school for 23 years. And, uh, I, you know, I worked at the artworks and, and worked for, uh, Abby's dad and I worked at the phone company with John and, <laughs> Uh, I own several businesses, including uh, Radio Shack, uh, I, uh, the Orcas Outfitters, East Sound Sporting Goods, Kingman Lock Service. Uh, we still have the antique shop. And, and that's about it. I wrote a book on the history of the island uh, that's uh, sold, I don't know, over the years, 10,000 copies. Did that back when I worked at the Sounder. And uh, that's, that's about it. That is a fabulous book. <laughs> Did you reprint it yet? <laughs> no, I'm still working on it because I want to expand it to the whole county. So it's taking a while. Cool project. Thank you, Tom. Dave, you're next. Oh, hey there. David Page uh, came to Orcas uh, uh, June 7th of 1985. Uh, I had visited my brother previously uh, in 1983. I came up for Thanksgiving, came up on the uh, Amtrak Coastal Starlight and um, and uh, Denise Devereaux, now Denise Wilk, her mother picked me up uh, at the uh, train station in Seattle and uh, gave me a bed for the night and put me on the uh, Evergreen Trailways the next morning 
downtown Seattle, and I got into Anacortes about 6 a.m. And uh, we had a breakfast stop there, and then they took me on to the ferry. And uh, so I got on the ferry uh, in November and got off at Orcas Landing and went up to the Orcas Hotel, and uh, the doors were wide open and there was nobody there. And um, so I waited uh, across the way at the cottage gift shop and Dan and Denise, my brother Dan and his gal pal at the time, Denise showed up and took me to their place, which was uh, one of the original cabins at the Helsel property. And um, cabins that apparently were built for the uh, supervisors of the lime kilns. And so, they put me in the loft in this little one, this one little one room cabin that had kerosene lights and there was a dug well out back. And uh, that was my first introduction to Orcas Island. I stayed for about 10 days and said to myself, I'm going to come back here someday if I get a chance. And uh, the chance came in 85. So came back for the summer and uh, got a uh, work a job at Orcas Hotel, ending bar. And um, and that lasted for seven years. And I got to know quite a few people for better and for worse. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, proceeded to uh, uh, quit that job and got myself a job selling real estate with uh, Pat Pomeroy and Jay Hagelin. I did that for two and a half years. And then I had enough of that and got my little grub steak up on North Beach, up in Wilmaville, they called it. <laughs> where Wilma Ray's outfit was, and, uh, and uh, that was in 1992, and and um, so uh, well, my first seven years were uh, formative in that I also working at the hotel, and I lived at Olympic Lodge in Deer Harbor, which uh, you played a little snippet about that earlier, and that was a very very good time in my life, and as a matter of fact, I see Mr. Bill Engel over there. Bill and I go way back, and uh, we were young fellas who uh, enjoyed uh, drinking, hoisting a beer uh, on the beach, and um, admiring the pretty girls as they walked by. <laughs> and uh, so um, that's uh, that. I, I, I uh, so here I am now, and I don't know uh, really how much more to elaborate, but I'd be happy to. If anybody and you're, you're, you've are you got outer space in the back of the... Indeed. <laughs> you're out of this world. <laughs> if you are outer space, you'd be looking at a blank wall. So I thought this I like was perfect. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Jerry and Susan, you're on mute, so. And I, be, you're still on mute, but give me your maiden name. You're on, you're, Jerry, I know that's your nickname, so we need to have your full name. Uh, my unmarried name was Clark, um, as was my sister's. Uh, my mother attended Four Winds Camp as a camper in the early to mid 30s. She was from Portland, where her family had lived for some time. And later in the 40s, her mother and father bought land on Orcas down uh, next to Bob Shane's, Bob and Mary Shane's place, and they built a house there. Um, and my parents met in the Army in World War II. They were both stationed in Georgia. My father was from New Jersey, was not a farmer knew nothing about farming. They were on their honeymoon, uh, came to visit Portland, my mother's family. They uh, took a drive up to Orcas because mom loved it. They saw a farm in the middle of Crow Valley. It was not for sale, but they asked about it. This was in uh, about November of 1945. In January of 1946, they bought it from Donald Reams, who at the time owned Rosario. Um, Mrs. Reams had owned the farm to house her protege, whom she did not want to go to be drafted. But it turned out he was 4F anyway, so she was willing to sell it. So <laughs> 
been there, been here since then. Um, although both of us were born in Portland, but uh, my sister, Susan, has been here for most, <laughs> most, of my life. most of her life. I vanished when I graduated high school in 1962 and uh, went to college and law school. And now I'm back frequently um, living in my mother's house that she built with her own two hands Eddie and Eddie Lavender, a retired carpenter back on the back 40. The farm uh, is about 340 uh, eight acres and it's right across the road from Abby's Driftwood Ranch. Abby and I have a fairly similar background and history. Um, <sighs> We raised first our own crops to feed animals. We started with um, workhorses. There were three other farmers around who only worked with work, worked with workhorses. We got a tractor a couple of years later, and then we we uh, specifically raised for many years Hereford cattle and Arabian horses and showed the horses and cattle all over the place in Western uh, United States. And I think that's it for moi. I'll turn it over to my sister. Let's see. Well, I'm gonna have to use notes. Um, I was a mail order baby. Mom was pregnant up here and she'd send all her uh, information down to the doctor down in Portland because that's where she grew up. And, and uh, uh, so uh, when it was time for me to be born, drove down to Portland, had me, and then in those days you stayed in the hospital 10 days. So I was baby of the year because they used me for demonstrations on baths and stuff. So I came home in a 47 GMC truck with a cow in the back. And uh, when I opened the door, Jerry looked in and she's about five and she looks in and I'm in a cardboard box and she goes, but she hasn't any teeth. <laughs> so um, let's see, uh, mom, mom and Pat aren't, were some of the founders of the library. And there used to be a parade that would go through town. It would start kind of by Outlook Inn and go up that street. And um, she would ride her horse. Um, this was her outfit. I think it was probably her grandmother's. And I know it was her grandmother's side saddle. And um, so she was representing the library. Uh, what else? Oh, well, I went to school all the time here, of course, like, you know, we all did. And there were 18 in my class. And I wanted to see a different part of the world. So I went to Mississippi State College for Women. Never been back. Graduated there, but never going back. Um, when I was in high school and stuff, um, I, Jerry and I would separately, but we'd go with daddy and do horse show tours. And I'd go on pack trips up in the Cascades with mom. So we used our horses and we showed them. Uh, let's see. I crossed the channel and married a Friday Harbor man, but he graduated from high school there, but he'd grown up all over the country because his dad was um, with the civil service, um, our, the, our, my parents' farm was JB farm. It wasn't, didn't stand for anything, maybe Jerry. Um, so when we got it, we did JBS. So we had John, Jessica, Blake, and Susan. So it finally stands for something. <laughs> so yeah, we had two kids. Um, and the funny thing is when my kids went to school here, there were a couple of kids in their classes that I went to school with. There were some Lindholm kids and some Hurley kids. Um, let's see, then I, I was a wedding and portrait photographer and now I do the dahlias and John does all the fruit. And so that's our story. <laughs> now I'm gonna hit mute. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so a little open discussion with, um, I gotta admit somebody here right there. Uh, I thought the first topic I would ask about would be the roads back uh, when you were first here. So um, whoever wants to jump in. I will. Um, we used to be able to ride horses on the road and 
not get run over or, you know, that kind of thing. Most of the roads were gravel, at least ours was, the Nordstrom Lane. We knew every car that went by, you knew who was driving it. Uh, it was, you know, a small community. Now, I don't know anybody. Um, because we didn't go anywhere back then. We went to school or you went to church or you went to art class or, you know, things like that. And, oh yeah, I used to ride around the block and pick up bottles and, and turn them in at the West Sound store. And then I'd get candy. <laughs> <laughs> And in those days, when they had licorice, they were just in a box. You would just pick out each one that you wanted. <laughs> so. Where was the West Sound? Was the West Sound store where Kingfisher is? Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's a sad thing that the West Sound store is gone. It was the community center, I guess, like the Alga store or the Deer Harbor, one of the, both of those stores. I, have never been to Kingfisher. It looks like a nice from the outside place, but it was fabulous when I was growing they up. They had like a little um, ice cream bar where you could get coffee. You could sit at stools and I'd get good girl ice cream where Harry Boddington would dip the ice cream cone in little sprinkles. So I remember your dad always sitting on one of those stools in his, in his overalls and uh, carrying forth. <laughs> what how many people were here when you were living here what, as a kid 860 when we arrived don't know yeah per that would be about right back in them days right yeah after. yeah when yeah. i first was meeting john um the phone company was shaw i think and Fr Friday Harbor or San Juan and Orcas, but Lopez, no, San Juan was long distance. Mm -hmm. And no. so when I went over there, they were celebrating their 2000th phone. So that was in the seventies. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what that tells you, but there weren't nearly, now there's a house everywhere. <laughs> we used to have um, um, for the phones, a, um, uh, a, a crank phone and my phone number Jerry and Susan remember theirs my phone number was 46 and we had eight to ten people on our party line I don't remember how many but uh, uh, you could always tell when somebody's listening because the whoever you were talking to got weaker and weaker and weaker as people would lift up the phone but the best part and we missed this last time was Hazel who worked at the, she was the operator. She stuck those things in the right holes. And, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and their daddy was always waiting for a call from his agent and he would call Hazel and say, I'm gonna be at the Hawkins tonight. And so when his agent called, she hooked him up at the Hawkins or, um, <laughs> or daddy would call, do you know where so-and-so is? And, and has, Hazel would say, well, he just drove by in his tractor. So it was, it, was, um, it was sort of a wonderful central information center too. She was amazing. She was really funny. And I asked her one time, a long time later, I met her in Seattle, ran into her, and I said, did you ever listen in? She said, oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Too tempting. <laughs> yeah, she knew all the gossip. <laughs> Anybody else got any comments about the roads? We, I was here when they developed the Schaefer Stretch Road. We used to go to East Sound by uh, um, uh, West, uh, uh, West Sound and the Crow Valley Road. And uh, so when they started working on it, we were all very excited and, and it was dirt for, it was gravel for a long time. And I, I remember going into East Sound with my parents and, and begging dad to go on that road because we thought it was so cool. It was, daddy hated it, but he did it. We drove on that road for a long, long time until it finally was paved. I can mention something out here on the east side. Uh, well, one thing in Doe Bay, our, our uh, roads still aren't wide enough to have a stripe down the middle. But 
we and our in my county roads still uh, gravel. But uh, when I was younger, you used to be able to drive up through Eagle Lake and uh, all the way to East Sound that way. So it was actually a, it was a big loop. Now that wasn't a legal way to drive, but the road existed all the way through. Was it a logging road? It was, yeah, it, it's that quality of road. Um, I mean, theoretically, if it wasn't for a guy that put a gate up, you'd still be able to do it. But it's, yeah, it's basically logging road quality. But mm -hmm. I, but we, I did it years ago before Eagle Lake became Eagle Lake. So that was back when it was Utter's Pond. If yeah. I'll remember Judge Utter. Yeah. <laughs> went from a pond to a lake when the, when the property value went up. <laughs> Did it get, so it connected with Raccoon Point Road? With Raccoon Point, yep. I bushwhacked that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, how about we talk about the fire hall, where it was, what was happening back in the day? Well, that's where Rose's uh, cafe is now, was the fire hall. And, um, I do recall in the storm of 89, when every water pipe on Orcas Island broke, you could still get a shower at the fire hall. You really wanted one. You could also get your driver's license there. Right. You could get a lot of things there. <laughs> there were, um, the, the fire hall in Orcas now used to be an old school. Uh, it used to belong, and then, um, not the firehouse itself, but the house on, on above it was the Orcas School um, and used to belong to Les Morgan. Is that where the bakers live now? Michael yeah, Morgan? yeah, yeah. It's in the Baker House now. The Dobe School House or the Dobe Fire Hall is interesting because the, the property and building is technically owned by the school district. And the community, the Dobe Community Association takes care of everything, and then the fire department uses it. So, <laughs> sound. Um, there was a garage right next to the West Sound store, and there was a rattle trap fire truck in it. And of course, the operator would call up people in West Sound. Uh, the store owner, Harry Boddington, or Ed Ferry, whoever were kind of, they would lived next to the uh, fire truck. And my sister has an amusing story about that fire truck. I thought you were going to tell it. No, you are. Oh, God. <laughs> um, well, the battery wasn't any good when they had a fire. So daddy hopped in the truck and had mom push it down the hill <laughs> to get it to start. That's it. <laughs> Do we laugh now? <laughs> <laughs> what about back to the landers and hippies? We all were, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're wanting to know about the group that, that established uh, uh, a homestead down below the golf course. Is that what you're interested in? Sure. Is, who had a story about them? Well, I all, I re all I remember about them is that the Boddington house was being dismantled and we, we were part of a group of, of wayward children um helping to dismantle that and we loaded all, all the wood onto i think nick exton's truck and he took it down there i never went down afterwards but it always amused us that these kids who are probably lawyers and doctors and, and ceos are were decided that they would get back to the land and have a farm and sell their produce. And, uh, and I think when they discovered that it was really hard work, uh, it never happened. <laughs> hey, does anybody want to talk about, since it's a little older than me, the hippie camp out near Indralaya? 
That's the one I was talking about. Oh, that's what, okay. Yeah. Chris yeah. Butler lived there and he told me uh, how it ended. Oh, good. You live there? So that was, uh, apparently some people showed up in the middle of the night and told them they had 30 minutes to get out of there. Oh. And um, it was, it was uh, burned to the ground. It, Rolf Erickson knows exactly where it is. Says there's still like a piano, a harp there sitting there from mm -hmm. when, the, when it all burned down. Well, it was below the golf course. You went down Sunderland Road or whatever the name that road is now. And and then you took a left, uh, um, a left and it was right at the end of that road. It uh, must be a different camp because we're all No, because the that's below, him. that's below Indralaya. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. same property. Yeah. Then. Same property. He told me who the owners of the property. There. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody got any stories about Moran State Park? One of the things that we talked about was the 4th of July. And before we had a parade, um, there used to be, and I'm not sure who put this on, but um, a sort of a party and things for kids to do at the lake on the 4th. And families would get together and potluck and they would have um, uh, three-legged races and uh, all sorts of things for us, um, swimming contests and things. Uh, and, and it was it was really a fun island community family affair. Um, I don't remember when we started having not started not doing that and then started having parades. I don't remember that year, but I remember several, wonderful 4th of July's at Moran State Park. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess uh, ice skating up on the Summit Lake used to be a popular sport. Yeah, I did that. Did you? No, but I spent a lot, because since I work above the gates, I get to spend a lot of time up near Summit Lake during the winter and it's beautiful. Yeah, I remember one night skating up there and it was a full moon and you could see the 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 growth in under through the ice. It was stunning. It was just beautiful. I had a, a horse that died. Well, it wasn't mine. Dorothy Gott and I, my best friend who lived in Deer Harbor, in the summers, uh, we would ride our horses to the park and we would camp. This was when John O'Dell was the sole employee and the superintendent up there. And there was, n it didn't cost you anything to be there. So one year we were, we rode our horses up there, camped, got up the next morning and it was a bad day because O'Dell's dog had eaten our food. And then we went to get the horses and hers it died, I think it was of colic. Hmm. Of course, it was hugely traumatic. And um, somehow, oh, I guess she must have called from John Odell's house, got her parents up there, and we were saved. And oh, the, the other worst part, um, my for some reason, maybe my parents were gone, but I had to ride by myself, my horse home. However, he got a saddle sore, very tender skinned. So I walked next to him in my cowboy boots and had the worst blisters <laughs> in the world. It was a very bad day. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so um, um, I, I have a question here to ask Susan and Jerry about their mom, Sherry Lindholm Carlson, Carl, Carson, entertaining everybody at the community stage shows as the dancing horse. Oh, that was Rollholm, uh, Carol Lindholm. Carol Clark. Rollholm, yes, Sherry Lindholm and mom. And uh, I still have the roll home paper mache head, head that I do you? senior center a couple of years ago for show and tell. Um, they tap danced, both of them knew how to tap dance. And so they worked out this routine. Cherie was the back end of the horse and mom was the front end. Well, Cherie uh, got jealous and said, I want <laughs> in once 
So they traded and Cherie got uh, claustrophobia <laughs> and said, I can't do this. <laughs> but they would wear yeah, gray, uh, leggings. long Thank underwear. You. Leggings were not around in those days. This was in the 50s. And um, this horse had rubber eyeballs and it was painted. And it was white. It, yeah, it was but white. But he had a pink tongue that was a shoe, a shoe sole. sole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. They were a great hit at, everybody on the island was very talented back in the um, 50s and 40s, musically or dancing or, or reciting poems. Um, from kids to the adults, they all did something. And we all did it at our community centers in each of the little birds. Green tunnels. But one time they were dancing and they were gonna do this trick. And it was, it was some, I want to say stuffy guy that was MC. Oh, yeah, a stuffy guy, right. And um, he was the MC. And to his surprise, Cherie, the back end of the horse, sat on him. They danced over to him and sat. Yes. <laughs> so was that the one that I know that um, our parents all did the March of Dimes, a show that was at the Grange. Yep. Uh, mother wrote the script. Daddy was the MC, and um, and um, all. And I think that was the one. It was mo amazingly popular. I I think I gave up the script to somewhere. Maybe the library, or maybe the. But but there were um, most inappropriate blackface people and. Uh, Clarence Sewell played the the banjo. Do you think that was the one? Well, they did it several times in several places, but your father, Charlie, was not stuffy, so it would not have been him <laughs> no. that he sat on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean his name was stuffy, or was he just a stuffy kind of guy? Well, it was very important. Somebody like, how can I say this, Abby, because you are the one who should talk about him, Roderick Marble Olsen. <laughs> My neighbor. Yeah, I know. Captain Hornblower, yeah. Oh, I like that. He used to come up the road. He lived down here, and he used to come up the road, and he'd honk at every corner. <laughs> So we knew where he was going, when he was going out, when he was coming in. <laughs> Hilarious. Hey, Dave, tell us about your, you talked about the 4th of July the other day. Oh. It being your yeah. one of your things you really missed. Yeah, that when I, when I first came here, there was the, um, uh, I, I think they had a special name for it, but um, it was a big community event at, at the uh, our house, which uh, was an was a Jackie Ryan's Realty um, place at the time, right across from Shinola Realty, and our house apparently I understand was a rooming house. That's how it got the name Our House mm -hmm. uh, back in the beginning, like turn of the century, I guess. But um, anyway, out on the front lawn, they uh, set up a uh, a woodsman's skills demonstration, like. Uh, uh, Denise Wilk and I uh, entered the Ma and Pa saw bucking contest, and uh, we went up against Jay and Denora Fowler, and um, I think we won, as a matter of fact. Not that we should have, we just got lucky. Uh, but there was other people, uh, you know, splitting alder rounds, and uh, there was a bunch of guys that would always bring their antique machinery and, uh, you know, big single jug, uh, one lung engines, and uh, you know, they'd spend all afternoon getting those things to run and they'd stand around and ooh and ah as it would, uh, you know, uh, ignite on every fourth revolution. And uh, there was, uh, you know, lots of pie and ice cream and corn on the cob and, and that was just very cool. And uh, there were no sidewalks or landscaping at the time, of course, except for whatever uh, brush or trees were growing in people's front yards. And, uh, so it was much more rural, and uh, and that, that was very interesting. And what time frame was that? That was eighty five. And, and I, 
was the lots of people there? Were there lots of people? Uh, the whole community was there, all, all 10 of them. <laughs> I think, what, Dave, was it called Pioneer Day? That's what yeah, it was. It was yeah, Pioneer Day. Day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, axe throwing, and they did the, I was always impressed with the climbing. The guys would do the exactly. speed climbing. Right, all, all, all demonstration of woodsman skills. Mm. They had one, one year they had a thing about pounding nails and um, somewhere in my, in the, in the bowels of my uh, junk is a picture of Llewellyn McCoy and I competing on pounding nails. Nail driving and, contest. Nail driving contest, Llewellyn won. <laughs> I know they still do that at Crow Valley Days, which is the uh, Island Hardware Celebration. Oh, do they? Yeah, they still do that. And um, Dr. Dirty always played music there, of course. Right. And the band du jour. And uh, knife sharpening and blah, 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 all that stuff. Quite a party. What about um, Orcus Tonight? Kathy unearthed this great video and that I'm gonna post on the uh, Then and Now page, but I was wondering if anybody could speak to that. Is that the King Five uh, thing? I think so, yes. I, I saw that. Oh, saw that was with Gail Brown and Gail, mm -hmm. uh, our, our many uh, variety shows that, that Gail, et cetera, and mm -hmm. we all produced to raise money for Orca Center and a rug for Gail's school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that there were a lot of there were a lot of people in them. There, the one thing that they showed on that King Five thing was now I don't remember exactly who, but they they Shivsky was one of them, and they they made made a, the uh, they made up the bellies of these rather large men except for Shisky who was pretty skinny and 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 they did this sort of song I can't remember the song even but and they they would like be singing on their belt it was very funny <laughs> it was the it was the whistling thing from the bridge over the river oh, that's, thank you da -dum, remember. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Yeah. That's, that's what it was yeah and then there was um well I think that was the one that Tom Tallman was tap dancing in. Yeah. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah, he was amazing tap dancer. Hmm. Yeah. You you posted a picture about with Tom with Tom's wife and um, the Browns or something on the on your site. Is that I did I see that? I'm not sure. I don't know what his wife's name was. Um, I want to say Mary, but that's not right. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, it's, then there was another guy that was dressed up like a clown, uh, singing a rice something about Rice Krispies. But the one that was really funny was the Shanana group. Who was that? Who do you remember, Jerry? Somebody named Gillespie, Terry Gillespie, is that right? Oh yeah, Terry, that's right. <laughs> Mary Lou Nickel. Was Mary Lou in that? I think so. Yeah, Mary Lou. Um, uh, Dave Roseberry was in that uh, in that video, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. And Joe Nickel was he in that? Um, uh, he sang the year that that was done we did it at rosario at the discovery house mm -hmm. yeah. probably duff and marilyn were there and all that oh stuff. totally mm -hmm. yeah uh, i mean there was there was if there was a group of us kathy younger and there was just this wonderful group of people that that um we sort of had children and grew up together that did these things, these, these, uh, June Schulberg was, June O'Dell was uh, usually part of the orchestration and music. Um, 
to think about it for a minute. And then uh, let's talk about the library fair because I think Tom brought that up. That's one of his favorite things that he misses. Did that begin as the A Street Fair or not? No. That was different. It, it was. What was the A Street Fair all about? Is that a benefit for somebody? I'm going to yeah. the A Street Fair. Yeah, children's House. Chamber of Commerce. Children's, children's House. Children's House, I think. Yeah. No, 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 no. No. Dolphin Bay School. Oh, that's it. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of the cast of characters and I thought, well, they were yeah. Children's House and then they were also Dolphin Bay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Susan could probably talk about the start of the library fair a little bit. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I was probably living at Friday Harbor um, when, when it started. I don't know. We moved over here uh, 19. Well, we started when daddy died. Then we started to help mom run the farm, which too many women in the house. So <laughs> we moved back to Friday Harbor and Jessica was born. And so it was like a year more later. But mostly I just was on the farm and kids. So it wasn't that social. <laughs> <laughs> so I can talk about the library fair. My mother was um, the secretary. My mother and, and B were really good friends and they decided, and it was a volunteer library. And uh, so they decided they needed to make money and um, started the library fair. And it started out with antiques and, and whatnot and books. And then people would have... Um, uh, stalls that they sold stuff in. There was food and, um, and entertainment. And they kind of took up, it was right after the St. Agnes Guild sale. So, so they, they sort of took over that part eventually of the road. So they blocked off the road from, you know, sort of the Episcopal church fence up to a ways anyway, probably the corner. And um, uh, lots of people came. And I, I remember when we, we worked, Tom worked, we all were, were uh, as young people um, convinced that we had to be part of it. Tom, Tom helped Bob Rao, right, Tom? Yeah. And uh, who was an antique appraiser? Yeah, and, on TV. <laughs> yeah, and and um, uh, and Reeves Moran, who was a character in his own right, uh, worked in the was the money taker. So we'd take our we'd take the money to Reeves, and he'd be he'd be counting it and telling us how much money they made. And uh, and one year we had a a little stage in the middle of the road between the library and the and the Episcopal Church where we had entertainment and one year there was somebody on the island I, I name unknown and she taught belly dancing to a lot of people it was such a good way to get exercise do you guys remember this and and um uh so her belly dancing class uh, performed, and, and and probably some of them shouldn't have. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was uh, it was a big going concern until the library moved up the hill and became part of the government. <laughs> I mean, it was actually a great money maker. Um, it was. So I don't, like for exactly the one year that I ran, because I can remember these numbers. The one year I ran the auction, this would have been in the early '90s. We uh, made about twelve thousand dollars between the silent and the live auction, and then we were we were donated a boat that year, and we raffled off the boat, and that brought in another about ten thousand. And that was just one part of it. I mean, the uh, quilt was a huge deal, the yearly quilt. Oh yeah. And, I we yeah. All did that, yeah. yeah, all the and the quilt made a lot of money. And the other thing that made a lot of money for quite a while was uh, Roy Pringle's class would do a dory, and the dory would auction off every year and bring in a good chunk of change. 
So it was, I mean, it was the main way before taxes that, that the library got money. So mm -hmm. it was pretty important at the time. <laughs> it was, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay, let's talk about some memorable characters, their names and why they're memorable to you. Nobody's mentioned Henry Sato. Does anybody remember Henry? Yeah. He was a, uh, a, a Asian American guy. I never met him. I only heard about him. And so I, I guess he was a concert pianist and a, and a very eccentric kind of guy that never drove anywhere. You saw him walking. This is everything that I've been told by other people. I didn't know him. Didn't he live down in your neck of the woods, Tom? Yeah, I, but yeah, I didn't know him either. So, but he did live out this way. Yeah. See, it's like Susan and Jerry said, we didn't get past you sound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, you know, the same thing I hear, I knew everybody out here, but the people I remember from town, like one of the big, the big ones, well, of course, Roger Perdue, which we talked about before, but one that wasn't mentioned was Joe Long. Uh, there's a guy that actually had a little bit of world fame with uh, Orcus Pear, but he was quite a character. So. Yeah. I, I remember he 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 would uh, you know go into these uh, random uh, 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 religious rants for uh, every once in a while, but otherwise he was a, one of the sweetest guys. He was a county extension agent. Yeah, I still got his actually. He grew up here. I still got his uh, uh, Boy Scout book here somewhere in my cabin. <laughs> yeah, he's got Long's Tree Farm just three hundred feet down the street from me, right here. And <laughs> I've got two orchid squares in my orchard, so. But yeah, if you look at it, I mean, Dave's probably seen this. If you look at it, almost any agricultural catalog uh, that you come in the mail, you find the orchid pear and it mentions Joe in there. Yeah. Hmm. If you look it up, there's a Wikipedia entry about Joe Long, an Orcas Island fruit farmer who discovered the orchid pear. And it got cataloged. Did he breed it or did he discover it? I believe it was a, it was a volunteer that just was ah. sprouted and grew on his property, I think. Birds. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, oh, there's, go ahead. I, I remember Mrs. Benson, um, uh -oh. her husband was Father Benson at the Episcopal Church, and she used to give art classes to kids at school, and we'd walk down, stop at Bernie's and get candy, and then go in and paint, and we've, learned with acrylics and she um, had us, uh, she got for us and we got um, Chinese brushes and she taught us how to take care of them. And then on, I think it was Wednesdays, the adults came and then um, there were a bunch of paintings that I sent to Vicki that mom did of locals then. And uh, it was another good community thing. And, and uh, she was just a sweetheart. We even named a cat after her. Right. We had Mrs. Benson, the cat. Because she oh, gave us a cat. <laughs> she was little and had white hair and she was British. And, and, and around, she was sort of round. And, um, and she sang soprano during the hymns. <laughs> no. <laughs> there, there are several kind of wonderful old geezers that I remember. Um, uh, Johnny Jones, Jonesy, we used to call him, who uh, raised uh, goats and rode horses, and I don't know what else he did, wrote poetry, um, and Les Morgan, who lived in now is the Baker House, and I'm not sure what he did, but he did eventually get a mail order bride. That was quite a discussion amongst the uh, adults. And um, Press Killebrew, who uh, Killebrew Lake is named after, and he owned all of that. And he was, he was a bit of a hoarder. Um, I, it, these were all, you know, Burek was another one who was on Dawson Bay Road. Their Orcas area, the hood, was full of kind of wonderful uh, characters. Um, Wally the people, Lung. Wally Lung. Lung. <laughs> Total Wally. character. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I, one of the things that we didn't talk about was the Orcas Hotel and um, 
I worked there when the Cundies, not, not the Cundies, uh, when, when, um, oh gosh, now I've forgotten their names, um, worked, owned it and Mississippi, nobody mentioned Mississippi. Did anybody know Mississippi? Mississippi played, Say, it again. Say that again. Mississippi Toller, is that who you're Yeah, talking? yeah, yeah. He used to play at the Orcas Hotel. Uh, he knew three chords and, and he'd play his three songs or five rock and roll songs and he'd get beer. Now, <laughs> and he was, he, was a, he was an old geezer. <laughs> I learned how to play the spoons and bottles from- Oh, from Candy. Yeah, and yeah. in fact, um, when I'm at the Legion in Portland, um, they have a jam session every Monday night and occasionally I'll go there and be the percussion part with my spoons and bottles. <laughs> Still can play. I played the gut bucket <laughs> there. That's where I learned how to play the gut bucket. Oh, daddy played the gut bucket. Yeah. Mom would play the accordion. And, oh, and the juice harp. Yeah, mouth harp. Well, <laughs> J-U-I-C-E, harp. Yeah. We were talking about the Orcas Hotel and um, I, ha I know Robin Sneed is on this call and um, I just wanted to mention a couple things that she wrote. She said, my aunt Irene Bellevue Hancock babysat Abby one whole summer. <laughs> she did <laughs> she also says um we remember dave page as a bartender in 1987 when we celebrated irene van morham's 90th birthday at the orcas hotel oh, oh, oh nice <laughs> nice <laughs> so anyway, yeah, maybe you could talk about the orcas hotel a little bit um well i was just going to say what Van Morham's built a hotel, do they not? Is that correct? Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Uh, uh, who? I think it was going before the Van Morhams. It no, was W.E. Sutherland, I believe, that built the hotel. But Van Morhams operated it, is that correct? Mm -hmm. They owned it for a while, probably. All right, yeah. that's, that's the thing. That's who owned so, it. So you, you mentioned, in, um, there was an article that I read that talked about Mrs. Swarthout. And she, she was part of the Orcas Hotel, but then when I was growing up, she was the postmistress at Orcas. And uh, I was said last time, you asked about old people, everybody was old. <laughs> I, was I, I mean, you know, 30 was old. So, so, but I remember her as being teeny and white haired and she was, she was the postmistress. The people that owned the hotel when I was there was the Becks, and uh, the, she was the one that put the um, egg cartons on the ceiling. Hmm. For a Mabel, Mabel Becks. Well, when I came to Orcas in uh, June of 85, I, uh, I uh, hung out my shingle and had the Page Brothers property service that my brother and I were cutting brush and making trails for realtors and all that kind of stuff. And we just weren't making ends meet. And I was uh, sitting on the lawn in front of my rental that I was about to lose in Deer Harbor. And uh, Libby Cook lived next door and she came home late in the afternoon and said, hey, Dave, how you doing? I said, not so good, Libby. I, I'm really, I'm broke. I need a job. She goes, well, Magic Mike at the Orcas Hotel needs a bartender real bad. Have you ever attended a bar? I said, no, I haven't, but I've spent plenty of time at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, went and talked to Mike and he said, yeah, you'll do. And I uh, started there. I think my first paycheck was August 15th, 1985. And uh, it threw me, they threw me right into the fire and it was sink or swim. And um, <laughs> So I uh, took me about three years to master that job and uh, see all the uh, disasters coming before they got there and get a handle on it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that was Barbara Jamison who restored that. Apparently she'd been a partner in it with Wally Gudgel and 10 other people. And uh, 
the uh, count, the uh, state was going to tear down the hotel and build the ferry holding lot there. Mm. She said, oh no, that absolutely won't do. <laughs> and, uh, she uh, bought out her partners and spent a, a, a king's ransom restoring that place. Rocky Rutledge and uh, uh, was the contractor and, and it was a huge community uh, effort to get that place rebuilt and painted and opened and she did it and all the girls wore uh, dresses and pinafores and she wanted me to wear some sort of a penguin suit but I refused. <laughs> uh, I wore I wore uh, golf golf polos and uh, short shorts and uh, white tennis shoes and that's how I tended to <laughs> And uh, we had uh, Beth and Cindy would always play out on the deck in the summer. Oh, yeah, I remember them. Yeah. <laughs> they were very, very popular. Mm -hmm. And that place rocked, man. We served fish and chips and burgers and potato skins and <clears throat> nachos and ch clam chowder. And uh, we just slammed the food out as fast as we could. And uh, the cocktails, there were no fancy cocktails, it was all gin and tonic. Bourbon and water, Budweiser, and that was it. Banana, banana Gorilla, remember that? Well, that was before my time. I didn't know how to make one of those. That, that must have been Norm. Norm Carpenter must have made those. Uh, it was Cundy's. He made a Banana Gorilla, and you could only have one because they were uh, huge and nothing but like worse than uh, ice Long Island iced teas. Long Island iced tea, yeah. And uh, so there was uh, Don. And Jeanette Jameson, Don ran the docks, and JJ was a bartender and a cook and all that stuff. And uh, my, Magic Mike, of course, and Jeffrey Coleman ended up cooking there later on. And, um, uh, uh, Billy Laporte washed dishes. And but Barbara Jameson, if it weren't for her, that place would be gone. It wouldn't have. It wouldn't have. Uh, you'd be parking your cars there right now to get on the ferry. Was she the one who made it, um, uh, what do they call it, so you can never tear it down? Uh, the, uh, the historic. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, historic. historic uh, landmark. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I believe she had it designated such, and that was, that helped her with, I think, the, this, it gave her a tax break or something like that. I remember seeing um, a Gretchen Kaiser on that paperwork. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, got, what Gretchen and Wally were on were partners in that for a while, for a long time. So then, um, if it hadn't been for that, I don't think I would have uh, stuck on Orcus. That was my anchor. It was three and a half days a week of work with tips, and she always fed you anything you wanted on the menu. And uh, between that and Olympic Lodge, uh, that is what kept me here uh, mm -hmm. long enough to meet Cynthia Lynn Morgan and. <laughs> the next phase of my and life. They, and they, uh... right. Well, since we're down at the Orcas Hotel, um, I wanted to say something about the ferry, and I may be leaping ahead. One of the things that I wish still existed was the Vashon, because that's what was in service back in the day. An amusing story about the Vashon, um, it had a counter well, that surrounded the cooking area and they made everything from steak to breakfast, et cetera, with a couple of cooks. And the guys on the ferry would sit and drink coffee and eat breakfast, et cetera. Well, <sighs> Waylon Weddle was headed to Lopez um, and he was sitting with my father and Hank Lehman and a few other farmer guys who were headed to the mainland. The first mate at the time was a guy whose name I don't remember, but my father called him Wiki Wiki for some reason. Mm -hmm. Well, Wiki Wiki came up and he tapped Wayland on the shoulder and said, we're about to reach Lopez and your truck isn't on. It fell off. <laughs> and sure enough, uh, who knows how it happened, but luckily his big truck was empty and it somehow rolled off the front of the ferry and that was that. 
Wow. Oh I don't remember that. That's a good story. <laughs> yeah. hey, I love. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I loved Vashon. Uh, I loved that lunch counter, that counter, and the seats that you could swirl on. They were green, I think. Were they green? They were green. Yeah. It had those poles. Everywhere. Oh, and did you did you hold those and go around and around and around? <laughs> Drove parents nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was anybody at the bash on the vash when the for the ending of its life ban here? No. What a huge party. Did you go, Tom? No, but we were at the ferry landing when they came in and everybody was hooping and hollering on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the little Hayu too. The do you remember that during the 80s? 89 storm was it 89 that I remember looking out on the bay and it was bouncing around like a little toy boat I mean it was like that boat could have been in somebody's tub and a little boy was playing with it and Scott you know it was just so sweet it was the only thing on the water and it, it stayed it was upright. the only boat that never broke down either yeah <laughs> right <laughs> Very true. Um, somebody asked, does anyone remember the sheriff that had handcuffs on the outside of the old house in East Sound where a quote prisoner would be held until a ferry would come take them to jail? I wonder if that was young. Um, uh, we used to call him Wyatt or uh, um, Jack Young. <laughs> Deputy Dog, we called him, but before that was uh, Eric Erickson from Friday Harbor, and it sounds like something one of the two of them might have had. Yeah, yeah. Don Loman? Question. Don Loman, yeah. Don Loman arrested my mother for speeding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was so excited. She wanted to it was during haying season and she was exhausted and she wanted to go to jail because it was in the hotel in friday harbor and she started gathering her books and was ready to go and then they decided they was they were going to send her to mount vernon or anacortes or i don't know where and so she paid her fine <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody remember a house in the parking lot between Dodie's A1 and uh, Temple? Yeah. yeah. And there was, when I moved here, there were two old guys that would spend a lot of time out on the porch. One was Rotten Ronnie Carson. Did you ever know Ronnie yeah. Carson? Oh, I went totally. to school with him. You went to school with Ronnie Carson? Yeah, and we always, oh, we were so cruel. We would girls would blow on their shoulders and say cooties if he came to you. So he was a uh, undesirable at that age? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, kids are cruel. And this was, he, I think, dropped out of school about our freshman or sophomore year. And he and I think it was Russell Brown used to be pals. Maybe those are the two guys you were talking about. But I understand Ronnie had a very difficult life. And of course, we never knew anything that went on uh, behind closed family doors. So, And I do not think he's alive anymore either. I think he did die, but... I, you know, in those days, nobody identified learning differences, and I don't think he could read even. So I, I think that that was, uh, he was probably at the back of the class and, and uh, ignored in the educate in, in school. Yeah. yeah, his father was a, he, they raised chickens. Uh, chicken farmers. Uh-huh. Sounds yeah. like Victor Bodie to me. <laughs> similar similar victor's dad couldn't read either um he could read comics i remember right hmm. well, that's too bad as it turns out um now that i'm 
back on the island since retiring much more frequently, I've heard stories um, about things that went on long ago, people I knew went to school with. I just had absolutely no idea how unfortunate and unhappy so yeah and how difficult it was for uh, a lot of kids who grew up here yeah i think that's right and because we didn't drive much um and and didn't go anywhere everybody sort of stayed home alone right um, I got to note that uh, Leith said Hal Caron, Karen? Carson, Carson, Hal uh, Car Carson, Ronnie's father started A1, which became Dodie's. Yeah. Maybe that's how Ronnie had the house next door. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why was he called Rotten Ronnie Carson? That wasn't anything we called him. Well, um, that's... That's what mean people like Dave called. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, you know, being a newcomer in 1985, that's what I heard people call him. He was, you know, he didn't have very good teeth and he had really poor hygiene and he sat on the front porch with a bottle of hooch and leered at the girls and they called him Rotten Ronnie, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah, so. And him and another guy, there was two guys, sort of birds of a feather, spent a lot of time on the front porch just watching things go by. Hey, Holly. Are you there, Holly? I'm here. Can you show those pictures? Yep. And then you guys can just have an open discussion as she shows these pictures. I always knew that as Nelson's dry goods. Yeah, belong, Major Ard built it. Yeah, she lived right. above it. Yeah. No. Then Nelson's. Wow. And now it is Pockies, right? Mm -hmm. right. The CD theater. They've taken off the flying buttresses, haven't they? They're gone. So that was closed for many years, was it not? Yes. I, I came here and they finally started doing movies again after like in 1990 or something like that. I don't remember it being closed. Huh. It, they did close for, I don't, I don't, I want to say it was only like two years or something. Uh -huh. yeah. When Alice was there? <laughs> My, I think Alice was still there with her one white streak of hair. <laughs> <laughs> who owned it john mount john our, mount our john friend. used to work at the phone company too he was uh, the the uh, tech the tech that stayed in the building radio he was the one who when the phone company got the dial phones bought them somewhere uh they couldn't get a dial tone out of them and uncle john he he was my mother's our mother's brother um, he figured out, he was quite brilliant electrically, electronically, um, and got dial tone to come on with the phone so they didn't have to go out and buy new phones. Huh. Cool. And this one, sorry, I didn't change the caption. Ignore that. <laughs> that was Derek Mann's real estate office. I mean, uh, Derek Vance's uh, law office there for a while before it got mm -hmm. torn down. It was uh, somebody's realtor, real, real. Oh, Bob Grass. Grass. Oh, was that Bob Grass? I think so. Bob mm -hmm. Grass, number one realty. Outlook. Whose van is that? Katie Jensen. They, they owned it at that time. Tina Davidson's her daughter. She had three kids. I remember Bob Grass used to put a sign up every time the state patrol was on the island. So we all knew <laughs> not to speed. <laughs> that was a ferry landing. 
They still had the the oil drums there. No, they they got taken down. Um, I know, but in eighty they were oh, still right, there. Right. Yeah, nice. well, I used to shoot weddings at the uh, Orcas Hotel, and over the winter, the wedding people would interview with Doug to find out about their wedding and the setting and everything. And they said, "Well, it's a beautiful spot, except for these oil tanks out here." And he says, "Oh, that's all right. I'll have them taken down by the time of your wedding." And it just so happened <laughs> that they got taken down and they were so impressed. <laughs> wow. uh, interesting note, you, I, I mean, everybody remembers there used to be that uh, warehouse building across from the store, right? Yeah, Lucy Bangs owned it and she had it full of stuff. Well, apparently uh, Bill Munich uh, got all the old bottles and stuff out of it and stuck them in a barn and... Uh, Hans is going to sell them all off this next weekend at his garage sale. Is this a, oh, really? Yeah, so if you want a piece of Orcus history, it might be an interesting place to get. I got a few from him early. <laughs> so where is Hans? If they're on the, uh, Eastman Road, uh, right behind. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, where. It's, so oh. where his mom lives, right? Yeah, it's where, that's where the, the sale's going to be. Okay. Is do anybody besides Abby, I know, remember the old ticket office that was right on the corner where now there's stairs and um, Bob Shane had owned it and uh, he'd have a pot belly stove and they're going in the winter and we'd all get out of our cars and go down there to stay warm on the early go. Wow. We didn't have a liquor store on the island in those days. And um, there was one in Friday Harbor and so if you were going to have a party, you'd give um, Bob some money and he'd grab whoever was going over to Friday Harbor to get booze for you. He liked bourbon and that's why everybody drank bourbon in those days. <laughs> uh, my memories as a young kid here on Orcas in the 70s was uh, uh, get, and being only here in the summer is it was a good one mile walk to get your ticket. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> you had to get a ticket on the way out as well as on the way in. Yep. Deer Harbor. That's the Norton Deer Harbor Inn. Mm -hmm. Where uh, Carpenter's uh, Deer Harbor Inn is now. Norton's. Yep. They used to have chicken dinners. Yep. Chicken. And you can see the dance hall too. Yep. Right. The white roof. New library. Okay. Library. Judy Benny's real estate or insurance, I mean. Yeah. In between where? Bungalow, which is now Whitehorse, and the church, I guess you call it rectory. And it was set back a little bit. And Junie Binney had an insurance company there. No, the next door was not the rectory, it was- Major um, Arts. It, no, Major Arts was across the street, but that was, um, oh, Hartung had a building there. It was at the original Orcas of, of East Sound store, grocery store, that Major building. Arts. And then it was the church property. Well, the church, I don't know whether, I don't remember anyway, where that is now is the, the parish hall. Hall, Calls that Benson Hall? Yeah, yeah. And then that building got moved to Lopez, right? Yep. This one? No, uh, the old Benson Hall got moved over to Lopez before. It yeah. Make room right. for the new one. It got it got moved <laughs> off the beach. That's in Lopez Village now. Right. And this one, the House of Things. That thing got torn down, as far as I know. 
I don't even remember it. Because the Chapel of Light is Lewis getting back the Chapel further. Of Light. It yeah. looks similar to that, but it's not the same. Got museum. So does anybody know the where these cabins came from? I'm they will the, the museum, they know. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's a sign in each one of them. Yeah. I think so too. To go. The airport in the upper left. Nobody lives on Buck Mountain. Isn't that nice? I mean, <laughs> that's the east sound I remember. Yeah, me too. No bay. Wow. That's no bay. Yeah. Store still there. I think what year five. was this? Do we know what year this was? Can't read it. I don't know the year. I got this the museum sent this to us mm. I asked for a picture of the Dobe school. Yeah, see that that school predates the one that the community built. Uh, there is a photo of the actual uh, Dobe school uh, after this one uh, in the district office at the school district. Good to know. Where is this? West Sound. This has to be the old spot, but it's just being kind of a part. Didn't Van Morum run that? Yeah. Ray Van Morum. Yeah, Ray Van Morum. And, it's, and then he was married to Al Alma, who was my third and fourth grade. Yeah, mine too. Mine too. <laughs> but yeah, it's still there, but different. All I got, Vicki. That's good. Thank you. All right. I was going to ask Tom. I know you do a lot of, I know you love history and you do a lot of digging around in that. And um, just was curious what some things that you found that were really interesting. I think uh, from the standpoint of the different uh, hunts I've gone on, uh, I think the Russian camp up on the mountain was the most interesting one to me. And um, the way I first heard about it and just, well, I'll just go ahead. The way I first heard about it was Dave Castor, who was one of the park rangers for 40 something years in the county and well, around, but mostly in the county. And he mentioned that there was a Russian camp up there, which led to a lot of questions that I had. Um, but uh, I can't metal detect in the park itself. But uh, um, as one of the caretakers of the private property, that's the 80 acres that sits within the park, I can metal detect that as much as I want. So uh, I spoke with Erling, who's the person I worked with and then eventually replaced up on the mountain. Uh, he told me that it was by the old cabin up on the property. And so, uh, uh, so I went up there with my metal detector and started hunting around and hunting around. And I found... Uh, you know, uh, area where there was a wood stove and a bunch of nails and bottles. And then I found another wood stove with, and this is all underground stuff and a bunch of nails and bottles and things like that. So I found that Russian camp. And so back in the, in the early day, you know, this is tur turn of the last century, uh, uh, a bunch of Russians came to Orcas Island and, um, and, and they, they built a camp up there where they did trapping and lumber work and things like that. And then ex basically exported this stuff down the mountain. Uh, or don't, uh, Mount Constitution at the time was actually quite crowded. There was uh, 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 little farms all around Mountain Lake, for example, and cabins. And then 
there was the uh, there was at least 12 mines up there at the time that's a whole nother story but but just to go to the russian camp so uh, uh, uh i i don't know any of the names of the families that lived there there's not a lot of record of that but uh, early had met a guy uh, years ago who was a captain on one of the ferries who was born up on the mountain in the Russian camp. Wow. And, and, uh, and he told Erling that, it, you know, it was uh, one of these cases where they all felt comfortable together. So they basically all just built little cabins around one another. So there's not much left because the cabins all disintegrated, except for the one cabin that's there supposedly is just been rebuilt uh, several times and that actually dates back to that Russian camp. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the most interesting. And then that also led to me meeting with the historian from Eddie, uh, Eddie Bauer Corporation because I suspected that Eddie Bauer might've been born in that camp because he was born on Orcas Island and his family are Russian immigrants. So, so meeting with him and he had some research and stuff like that. We actually discovered that he was born at the bottom of the old uh, road up Mount Constitution, which ends, if, if you know where uh, Perry and Mary Pugh live, that's the, basically the end of the Mount Constitution, original Mount Constitution Road. And that Eddie Bauer was born on the property directly across from that. Uh, there's a little point that goes out. So we tracked track that. So there was more other Russians living on the island, uh, immigrants than just in the camp. But mm. that was probably the most interesting. I mean, there's a lot of other ones that are kind of funny, like digging through old dumps, you'll get to, and the, you know, a uh, similar age, because every farm had a dump on the island. You'll go to one dump where you'll find lots of ink bottles, which I, I've got all this stuff here. You'll, you'll find lots of ink bottles and not one liquor bottle. And then you'll go to the next door neighbor's dump, which is just loaded down with old whiskey bottles. <laughs> and to me, that seems hilarious because there must have been an interesting dynamic between those people <laughs> to live right next door to one another. But th those are the kind of fun stories. But, you know, and, there, and there's lots of cool machinery I've found. And, and uh, uh, one interesting spot we uh, tracked down is before it became part of the park system, uh, uh, there was a piece of property up by... Uh, Eagle Lake, Utter's Pond, that was still private, so I could metal detect that, and I was metal detecting it, but in the bushes, I found one of the old Orcas Island school buses. I mean, the old, old school buses, mm. and, and, um, and, but now that's actually state property, and mm. so you, anybody can go there now, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting what you just happen to come across in the middle of the forest sometimes. Um, what about well, uh, Gary Larson, the, the cartoonist on a uh, cabin up there somewhere, didn't he? Um, um, Day Lake. On Day Lake. Oh, was it right yeah, there? he's up by Day Lake. Day Lake. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and I'm not sure he still owns it or not. Yeah. Well, I heard he sold it. Yeah. yeah. Just trivia. Yes. Um, he's, he sold it a few years ago. Um. Nancy, I was going to ask, I was going to thank you all for, for doing this today. Um, I'm pretty excited. This was our first one and hopefully we'll be able to do some more. And I wanted to let Nancy, um, the new director from the Orcas Island uh, Historical Museum to say a couple things. Nancy, I don't know if you can unmute or not. Yeah. Can you, I, can you hear me? All right. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Stilger. For those who have not met me yet, um, this has been fabulous. Thank you, Vicki and Kathy and all the panelists. Um, I am a newbie on the island. Um, and so I have much to learn and this has been super informative. So I'm really grateful. Um, I do hope to collaborate more with Vicki and Kathy as we move forward because the sharing of resources can be very useful for us all. And um, I have begun, I want to revitalize our oral history program um, called Orcus Voices that um, was done a number of years ago, but um, I want to get the next wave of people. And so I'm asking though, I would love to actually interview all the panelists um, officially and get it transcribed <laughs> and into our archives, if you're willing. And also, um, 
if people could submit names to me of those you think that should still be interviewed, um, I am going to write a grant, you know, to get funds to be able to do this properly and transcribe properly. So um, please um, stay in touch with me. My email is director at orcas museums.org. And yes, we know where all the cabins came from and have good history in them all. So if you're interested, give us a call and I'm happy to have any of you here. Um, I'm looking to get more locals involved. Our next exhibit is going to be on maps of Orcas Island. So I think that'll be, um, it should be opening at the end of June. So thank you for letting me be part of all of this and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks. Kathy, do you have anything else to add? Oh, no. I, of course, just probably like everybody on the panel, I had lots of things I could go, oh, and then there's this. I mean, not the panel, but participants, you know. Uh, it was fun to have memories jogged of, of time. So thank you all. <laughs> Thank you for participating and come next month to our meeting. It's on the third Tuesday of every month. And we'll let you know um, when we can do this again. Righty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. See you, Dave. Yeah, so long, Bill. <laughs>